We're going to round out today's program. Um, honestly, uh, Carl, right, it's, it's one of those phrases where you say last but not least at all. Um, we have a wonderful speaker. Nona Jones is here with us today. She leads the uh, global faith-based partnerships at uh, the Facebook, <laughs> as a lot of people call it. Um, her, she and her husband pastor a church in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, you might not have known that. Uh, called Open Door Ministries, and I think one of the things that you'll see when, when you talk to Nona for a while is that she has a passion in her heart for what we call digital discipleship on a very practical basis, but on a very conceptual, um, large picture basis as well. So Nona, as you come up, um, thank you so much for sharing um, your expertise and uh, wisdom with us. As um, a lot of people think, Facebook is just middle school for 40-year-olds, <laughs> but I think there's another way to use it for good for the kingdom and for digital discipleship. So um, one of the things that um, we hope to share with you today is practical resources like this, but we also want feedback after the program ends today. So please um, be sure to give us that feedback in, in the forms available. So Nona, thank you so much for being with us today. And oh, I'll thanks just, for having me. Uh, we'll take it off I give, there. I give uh, hugs. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> So uh, let me first acknowledge a truth, which is you all are the OGs of the NRB. I mean, you all have hung out until like the last second. And so I think you all need to give yourselves a hand because you all Dude, are like the for me. real, for real, time. real, for real crowd. So um, I'm so honored to be here. This is actually my first NRB. Uh, and so I hope that what I have to say to you uh, is valuable. Yeah. Now, before I get into the meat of this discussion, and I hope it will be a discussion, I want to first answer a question that yeah. I get yeah, asked all of the time, which is simply this. How in the Business world level. are you the head like, of yeah, faith-based really. partnerships um, at Facebook? I like, think I've been home how did that happen? And Kenny or someone, we hear you in the mic. Thank you. I was about to get quiet and see if we could get some, like, some secrets or something. But um, the question that I get asked all the time is, you know, how did you end up being head of faith-based partnerships at Facebook? Because most people, when you think of Facebook, you don't immediately think of faith, right? <laughs> so let me start with this. Um, so uh, it was April of 2017, and I was in a job that I absolutely loved. I was at the chief executive level of a statewide network of alternative schools in Florida. Um, um, and this uh, network of schools was for girls who had experienced trauma. And as a result of their trauma, they had perhaps acted out in ways that led to them getting suspended or uh, expelled from traditional school. And so they would come to this uh, school, they would get um, the, the, the help that they need, the emotional, psychological support, as well as the academic support that they needed. Um, and, and I don't have time to get into my personal testimony, but um, I myself am a uh, survivor of childhood physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. And um, when I was in elementary school, I was a kid that that acted out. I was the kid who was always in the corners. And so um, the mission of the organization really, really resonated with me. And I felt that I would be in that job for the rest of my career. But uh, I was four years into this, uh, April of 2017, and um, uh, I was in prayer. And the Lord said, the Lord said, this assignment is over. Now, mind you, I thought I would be in that job for at least another 20 years. So I said, all right, Lord, well, um, if this assignment is over, then what, what's next? What am I doing next? And uh, God didn't tell me uh, specifically what would come next. All he said was resign at the end of the fiscal year, which would have been June 30th of 2017. And so my husband is a pastor, and I told him, I said, honey, I said, uh, God told me that I am to resign from my job. And being the, the man of faith that he is, he said, okay, well, are the bills resigning too? And I said, well, I have no idea. I said, but uh, this is what God said. And so uh, June 30th came, and again, that was only like a month and a half after God told me to resign. June 30th came, I met with my boss at one o'clock p.m. that day, and I gave her my letter of resignation. Uh, I told her uh, why I was leaving, and um, she said to me, she said, well, well, what are you going to do next? Like, I need to be able to tell people where you're going. I can't just say, you know, our chief is, is resigning, and we don't know why. And so all I could tell her is, I'll tell you soon. 
Um, so I, I left that meeting at 1.40, and I got in my car, and this was a Friday. I got in my car, and uh, I was driving home. And at 2.05, I noticed that my cell phone was ringing. It was on silent, but I looked and I noticed it was ringing. And uh, it was an unfamiliar number, unfamiliar area code. I don't answer those calls because I assume they're telemarketers. Uh, but the Spirit said, take that call. And so I answered the phone. I said, hello. And this woman said, hi, is this Nona Jones? And I said, yes. And she said, I'm calling from Facebook. And I said, well, that's funny because Facebook doesn't call people. So who is this really? And she said, no, really, I'm calling from Facebook. She said, listen, I don't know if you know this, but uh, last week, Mark changed the mission of our company to focus on community building. And one of the communities that we've never focused on, uh, that we have been looking for leadership on, are communities of faith. And we were told that you are the person we should talk to about this. Would you be interested in learning more? Now, I thought they were putting together a committee, an advisory board. And so I said, okay, well, just send me some information. I'll look at it when I get home, and, uh, you know, we can talk about it on Monday. So I get home, and I open my email, and there's a job description in my inbox. And I said to my husband, I said, honey, Facebook just sent me a job description. And he said, well, why would Facebook send you a job description? I said, I have literally no idea. And so I talked to this woman on Monday, and I noticed on the job description that it said the job was located in Menlo Park, California, where Facebook is headquartered. Um, I lived in Gainesville, Florida, where our church is located. And I said to the lady, I said, this sounds incredible. I said, but, you know, my husband and I are in ministry, and I can't leave our church to go help other churches around the world, as amazing that, as that is. We're assigned here. And the woman said to me, she said, well, we require that you have to live where your job is located. That's a policy of the company. But we believe you're the right person for this, so we'll make an exception. And so today, I live in Gainesville, Florida. My job is in California. And I like to, to share this story with you because what I'm going to talk to you about today is not just about how to use social media to build your audience. Because what I need you to understand is that the job that I have at Facebook for me is not just a job, it's an assignment. I believe that God somehow plucked me out of anonymity in order to equip people who have a heart for ministry to use social media to do more than build an audience, to use social media to build God's kingdom because that's what we're here to do. And I remember when the Lord told me uh, to resign from my job, my prayer was, I said, well, God, I don't know what you have for me next, but whatever it is, I just want it to be ministry. And I thought that he was going to assign me to full-time ministry at our church. What I didn't know is that uh, all the way on the other side of the country, God was actually preparing uh, a job for me at the largest social network on earth. And so today I'm going to talk to you about making the transition from social media to social ministry because I believe that God wants to do something new with social technology in a way that we've never even comprehended before. Do you realize that right now from where you sit in your seat, you can reach the other side of the world without spending a penny? Do you realize that when the Great Commission was given and, and Jesus said that we are to, to go and make disciples of all nations, do you realize that for many years people thought that the only way to do that was to raise money and, and, and get on a plane and fly to another country in order to evangelize? But today you can actually spread the gospel of Jesus Christ for free to the furthest parts of the world. That's the power that social technology gives. But we have a problem. When, when I say the word church, this is what typically comes to mind. Most people think of a building with seats and a platform and a podium and a mic. When I say the word church, most people think of a place. But why? You know, I think about the fact that here in this world, we have 8 billion people, 8 billion people. And about a quarter of those to a third of those profess to be Christians. And this is a map, this is just a snapshot in time of Facebook users around the world. 
Now, it's a snapshot in time. What that means is uh, it would be like at 4.03 today and 26 seconds, we just take a snapshot and see what does it look like uh, for people using Facebook right now. This is an image, and it shows people in every nation, on every continent in the world. And when I first got into this job, I talked to uh, the social media director of one of the largest churches in America, and I said to her, I said, listen, I believe that God has given me a mandate to equip the body of Christ to use this platform in order to uh, make disciples. And she said to me, she said, yeah, we're not really interested in that. We use Facebook to get people into the building. That's our goal for social media. So in so many people's minds, social media is about butts and seats, right? It's like, let's drive people to a place. And I'm so grateful for my friend Nick and the presentation he gave earlier about making that shift from online to offline because in so many ways, we believe that uh, if we don't get people in a building, we haven't accomplished a goal. Um, and, and this is an image that I think is in so many people's minds of what success is. It's a building filled with people dancing to worship music and, you know, hearing a sermon and being so excited about it. But what I want to submit to you today and what I want to challenge you to think about today is, is this church? Is this church? Did Jesus tell people, hey, I've got a great message for you. I'm going to give it at 11 at the temple down the road on Sunday. Come see me then. Did Jesus do that? No. What Jesus did is he taught people, he equipped people, he healed people, he prayed for people, he set people free as he found them along his journey. Church was not what happened at a place, at a time, on a date. Church was a community of people who cared about the gospel and cared about the good news and took the good news with them wherever they went. And yet, he gave this declaration, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. But the paradigm of church right now is come follow Jesus on Sunday at 11 at our address. So I believe that what God wants to do and the reason why he even put me in this role at Facebook is because my heart, my passion, my mission is to help us get back to the biblical model of church, which never involved an address. It only involved a willing heart. So if you think about it, there is a, a vast sea of men and, and women and young people who are searching, and that's why I'm so grateful for the ministry of CV Outreach. There is a vast sea of people who are searching, but they won't drive to a building in order to find what they're looking for because most of them don't even know what they're looking for. And so there's a mismatch because while there's this vast ocean of people who need the gospel, we have come to define success this way. Yeah, there's a sea of fish out there, but success for me is the fish in my tank on Sunday. And if we're really, really good, then we'll look out from a stage and we'll see a huge number of fish in the fish tank. But let me tell you what the problem is. The problem with this is Right now, two out of three churches in America are declining or plateauing in attendance. Two out of three. Gallup did a study and they found that 40% of Americans say that they're attending church on any given weekend, but actual attendance is closer to 20%. To make this even more relevant in a broadcast context, when you think about the trends in television viewership and radio listenership, and you think about the trends, they're not going up. Because the traditional way that we've thought about communicating the gospel isn't matching people's reality. So in fact, 80% of the people aren't showing up to a building. And this is actually what most churches look like 
on any given Sunday. My husband and I, it's interesting, you know, uh, I told him because, you know, as a pastor, I get, to, I get to see this up front, up close. And as a pastor, there will be so many Sundays where he'll be discouraged because, you know, he preached with all of his heart to about 60 people. And I have to remind him, I say, well, honey, you weren't just preaching to those 60 people because look at our Facebook live stream and you see there was 500 watching. So the reason why I'm trying to try to get us to shift this paradigm of church as place is because as long as we restrict church to a place, we're going to miss more than 80% of the people. And what does, that, what does that mean? Like, okay, we understand the problem. We understand what the problem is, but, but then what is the solution? Okay, so we see that church attendance may be declining, and, and, and we even understand that people aren't, uh, aren't as involved in church as they used to be, but what is the solution? Well, let me give you this data point. Every single month on Google, more than 30,000 people are searching using the phrase church online. Every month, 30,000 people are searching online for church online. What does this mean? It means that while people may not be showing up physically, and while people may not be, you know, flipping the channel to the station like they used to, and while people very well may not be, you know, listening to their radio like they used to be, they are searching for a faith experience online because that is most accessible to people. So the question is, are we there? Or are we still going to require people to come to us? So when people search for church online, this is what they find. And the reason I know this is what they find, because I've done the search. (laughs) And what they find is the ability to watch what's happening in a building. But the question that I have and the question that I would ask you to consider is, is church a program to watch or is it a community of people to belong to? Because if the church is is a program to watch, we're doing a great job at that. We put a lot of time and energy into scripting things out and timing things out and, and making sure that we have the lights and the smoke and the sound and all of that. But that's only for maybe an hour, 90 minutes out of a week. There's 168 hours in the week. Are we maximizing the other 167 hours where people aren't tuned into the program, but they still need a community? Right now, the model of social media is basically like, hey guys, come sit down and look at our content. We want all of you to come and watch what we're doing. But I submit to you that that's not social media, Many of you will understand this. That's broadcast media. See, the difference between social media and broadcast media is that broadcast media is intended for unidirectional communication. I send you a message, hopefully you receive it. Social media is intended for, to use my friend Nick's analogy, which is absolutely right, relational communication. That's why it's called social. So if all we're doing is throwing content at people so that they watch it or they observe it, We're not actually doing social, we're doing broadcast. And so the opportunity that we have through Facebook in particular is to drive conversations and relationships. I want you to think of your Facebook presence like a house, okay? So your page is your front porch. It's the place where people can kind of walk up to you. They can see what your organization is about. They can passively consume the content that's on your page. They don't really have to commit to anything. They can see it because it's public. But Facebook groups are like your living room. It's the place that you can invite people inside of your organization. You can invite them inside of your mission. And when they're inside, a very interesting thing happens. They get to know you you get to know them, and even more importantly, they get to know each other. The thing about ministry that makes it difficult is, and I know this because I'm in it, the thing that makes it difficult is when you as an individual pastor are trying to shepherd an entire church by yourself. 
But it becomes so much easier when you have small groups and you have individuals who are actually ministering to one another. Imagine if your ministry, whether you have a broadcast ministry, television ministry, radio ministry, a blog, whatever you have, imagine if you also had a Facebook community that was linked to your page where people could meet each other. The people who uh, like your mission, the people who support your work can meet each other. And they can actually have conversations conversations around what you're sharing. Then it becomes discipleship. So for me, the, the shift from social media to social ministry is really about leveraging social media tools to disciple people in digital environments. And for me, the goal is discipleship. It's not just about building an audience. And this is, this is the challenge that I think we have before us, is when I meet most people, the first question they ask me, well, the first question is, how'd you end up at Facebook? I already answered that. It was God moving on. God did it. I had nothing to do with it. But the second question is, how do I build my reach? And the question that I always ask is, did the Lord ask us to build our reach or did he ask us to teach? Because there's a difference. You can use ads to, you know, build your reach, and you can have hundreds of thousands and millions of people who follow uh, your page, but I would submit to you that it doesn't matter how many followers you have if those followers are not following Jesus through you. We're conduits. It's not about the size of our following. The question is, how are we helping people mature in their faith who are connected to our ministries? And that's what social ministry is about. It was said so beautifully earlier, and I want to reiterate it today. So for me, the definition of discipleship is the maturation of our faith in relationship with others. Discipleship doesn't happen when we come into a building and watch a program. Discipleship is what happens when we're in relationship with other people, and we're challenging each other, and we're growing together. And these are the types of connections that we can have when we leverage social media for ministry. Facebook groups is the best platform within which to do that. So how do we do it? I want to give you some practical steps on how to do it. So first and foremost, remember, your page is like your front porch. You want to have a front porch because it's a great opportunity for people to just take you in casually. But then you also want to have a living room because your living room is where the ministry is going to happen. So when you have that living room, when you have that space where people can actually come into your mission, they can come into your organization, here are some things that you should think about. One, you wanna move beyond sharing content about your ministry to making disciples through your ministry. What this means is it's no longer just about sharing information about upcoming events. It's no longer just about sharing information about what you're doing. Now it's about driving conversations. It's about asking questions. It's about engaging people. And I will tell you at the very start, yes, it is an investment. It's an investment of time and an investment of energy because ministry cannot be passive. I think we all know that ministry doesn't just happen. It's not by osmosis. Ministry is intentional. And so it's about making disciples through your ministry. Here are some examples of things that you can do. So one, assuming that you have a page, you can create a Facebook group or a living room on your page. And as you create these groups, you can link them to your page so that people who come to your page can find a group that's relevant to them. Now, how does this look? So let's just say uh, that you have a uh, ministry or a program for women. You have a ministry or a program for young people. You can create groups that are linked to your page for those audiences. And then the people who feel like they belong to that demographic can join that community. And of course, you want to have people who are administrators and moderators of those communities who can, in a sense, help to drive those conversations in those communities. So people go to your page. They can discover your menu of groups. You can link up to 250 groups to a page. Um, and then people can join a group from your page. It's like a pathway. It's a wonderful experience. 
Uh, I wanted to share, you, share this example with you because something that I see in the, the Facebook communities of the ministries I'm working with is vulnerability, things that you will not see on a page because a page is public. So there are three privacy settings in groups. You can have a public group, which anybody can see that content, whether they're a member or not. You can have a closed group where people can only see that content if they've joined the community. And then you can have a secret group. And a secret group can't be discovered in search. People have to be invited. I'll give you the use cases for each of those in a moment. In this case, there was a young man who said, please pray for my friend Amber. She's thinking about taking her life. Now, why this matters so much to me is because if you notice, there are 350 comments on this post. You know how on a Sunday, there's always an opportunity to request prayer. We may even have prayer cards. You fill out the prayer card, you put it in the bucket or you put it in the box and you hope somebody prays over it. You don't really know. In this case, This guy knows that there are at least 350 people who are instantly praying with him and for his friend. When you talk about creating uh, an environment for discipleship, it doesn't get any better than that because you instantly can see that there's a community of people that care about you. There's another feature in uh, groups that I love, and I think this becomes uh, particularly relevant to uh, individuals who have a lot of content such as yourselves. There's a tool called social learning units. What learning units lets you do is it lets you create modular learning that people can take sequentially in your group. So let's just say, I'm gonna just make this up. Let's say that you're, um, you're a blogger and you, do, um, you blog about parenting. Well, you can create a learning module on um, you know, child discipline. Let's just say something like that, where maybe it's you know, five steps to a healthy, happy, well-mannered child. I'm making that up because I have two boys who are six and nine, and that is a dream of mine right in this instance. So if you have the the answer, please see me after this. So anyway, you could create a modular learning system where people in your community can take these units and they can discover the the key to raising these healthy, whole, and well-behaved children. So imagine, now you're not just a, a page, you're a resource. You're part of these people's lives. You're discipling them by helping them grow and helping them learn. Uh, Another feature that I love, and this gets into the idea of taking online offline, is there's a feature in groups uh, that's called Get Togethers. Get Togethers allows people to create lightweight events uh, in their local community. So let's just say that you have a national platform. Let's just say, uh, I'm going to use the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association as an example because I did an interview with them a couple days ago. They have a national, international platform. Maybe they have communities um, uh, all over the world and in all 50 states. Well, let's say there's the Florida Association or the Florida uh, chapter of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Somebody could say, hey, I'm in Orlando, and uh, this Friday I would love to have lunch with anybody else who's in Orlando uh, at Kiki's Breakfast Cafe on Vineland Road. I'm just making this up. Well, then people can indicate if they're in Orlando if they're going to go. And so now you've created an opportunity for people to connect offline simply by having a space for people to connect on Facebook. Something my husband and I do, which works really, really well, and I recommend this to every single ministry partner that I work with, is uh, you can go live in your groups. And these are such great ways to have more um, uh, intimate conversations with people. So as an example, the way we use this is, you know, I'm a preacher, my husband's a preacher. So uh, let's just say on Sunday, uh, I preach and I didn't get to everything in my notes, which typically happens. Uh, Didn't get to everything in my notes. I will go live in our group on Monday. And um, I'll go live for 30 minutes at 9 o'clock p.m. We'll have a time of prayer. We'll have a time of praise. I'll go through whatever remaining notes I had that I didn't get to. And then people can ask questions. And so now we've actually taken the so-called church experience from Sunday and we've pulled it into Monday. Let's say that you have um, people on your team who are experts in certain topics. Well, they can go live in the community and actually have conversations with people. And there's a wonderful feature on live now where you can actually go live with other people in other places. So there have been times that um, I've been interviewed through Facebook Live by somebody in another state. Um, But you can do that now, and it creates an opportunity for people in the community to feel like they have a special incentive to be a part of the group. 
There's also an incredible feature that I have been working on uh, over this last year with our education team, and it's mentorship in groups. How much more uh, of pure discipleship can you get to? Mentorship allows you to create a six, nine, or 12-week program uh, where people can actually be moved through content uh, that enables them to grow in whatever it may be. Let's say you want to create a mentorship program for people who are new to the faith. Uh, You can create an actual program that people can take in Facebook groups so they can actually begin to mature in their faith. And this has worked really, really well in cases where, you know, physical locations can be a challenge. So let's just say, um, you know, if you're a ministry and you have things in person, uh, some people may not be able to come. But if you actually can have those types of connections and mentorship in the group, people can partake of it whether they're able to physically attend or not. Something else that you can do with Facebook groups, and this is particularly relevant if you have programming that, again, spans different demographics, is you can link groups together. So you essentially create this, like, ecosystem of groups. This is an example of a church in South Carolina that I work with. Uh, They have a group for their main church. It's Relentless Online. This was an old picture because it says 733 members. They're now somewhere over, like, 11,000 members. Um, But they have one for their youth, uh, Relentless Circle for married couples. You can link them all together so that when people come to your community, they can see all the different ways that they can connect with other people who care about your mission and care about your organization. Organization. Something that I'm particularly grateful for is when I first got to Facebook, um, and it's funny that Bobby was in the video earlier. When I first got to Facebook, um, I had met with Bobby Grunwells, and I was like, you know, um, I love you version. I've loved you version for a long time. And so I met with our engineers, and I said, listen, I would love to be able to create an API that would push uh, content from you version into groups. And so we now have an API where you can actually automatically have the verse of the day sent to the community. And it's a wonderful way to build community around the Word of God. So it's a very simple application, but it's something that allows people to build community around what really matters. Also, there's the opportunity for polls in groups. I love this because as you think about, you know, you want to build uh, relationships with your various audiences. Imagine being able to poll them for ideas that you have about programs or events that you're thinking about hosting for your, your network or your organization. You can actually ask them, like, hey, if we were to do this, how many of you would like it? Yes or no? Or, hey, we're thinking about, you know, maybe launching one of three new programs. Uh, Which one would you want if we did it? So now you're getting real-time feedback from the people who are either fans of your page, who have joined your group, or people that you've just invited to join your community uh, from their email address. So it becomes a great feedback loop. Uh, And the last thing I wanted to share with you, which I think is so important, is as you launch Facebook communities as part of your social ministry strategy, you will see that there will be conversations that happen in your communities uh, that will make you create other communities based on those conversations. So one example is this is a church that created something called the Impact Community Bulletin Board because they were seeing a lot of posts about, you know, job openings and uh, people who were looking for uh, events and they wanted to promote their businesses, and they felt like, you know, those types of conversations aren't quite why we created this space. So they actually created a separate space in order for people to have those conversations. Another example is there was a church that I was working with, and um, they started to see in their community a bunch of people posting about um, opioid addiction. And there were people who said, would you please pray for my son? Uh, He just got put into rehab for opioids. And people were just commenting. They were like, oh my gosh, that happened to me, that happened to me. The church had no idea that the opioid epidemic had touched their congregation. They had no idea until they saw that. But because they saw that, they then created an offline ministry for people in their church who were dealing with addiction. It became such a powerful example of what happens when you're leveraging social media for ministry. Because they just didn't know. And I mean, when you have a very large church or ministry, there are things you just won't know and you can't see because there's just so many people involved. It's not that you don't care, you just don't know. Um, And so for me, these are just a few examples of some of the, the tactical ways 
that you can use groups as a method uh, for ministry. And I am so excited about this because I've already seen the power of groups to really catapult the impact that people can have when it comes to changing lives. So I'm so grateful for your attention. I wanted to leave and I've, I left about nine and a half minutes for questions because I definitely want to know what's on your heart, what's on your mind. I'm personally really excited about this, guys. I believe in my heart of hearts. I had been praying for two years. I said, Lord, you know, why did you send me here? Why am I here? Uh, and God told me it's for two reasons. One, I never applied for my job, which means that uh, my only allegiance is to the Lord because God put me there. Um, and secondly, uh, he put me there because my heart is for ministry. It really is. Every meeting that I'm in, every conversation that I have, the question I'm always asking myself is, how can this new tool or new feature be used to build God's kingdom? That's all I care about. So at the end of the day, I'm hopeful that uh, something I've said may have inspired your own thinking about how to reimagine uh, social media for the purpose of ministry. So thank you for your time. Happy to take questions in the time I have remaining. No, 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 no. <laughs> Give it up for you all for hanging out. I know we got a question here. We got someone to come here. So I think you have to just come to the mic yeah, in the middle. Mic's in yeah, the front. So real quick, we understand one of the consequences of social media is loneliness. And of mm. course, we had a huge consequence in the church of suicide. How have you? How does this all help with that? Oh, so thank you for this question. So, so it's such a relevant question. Now, what we have found statistically is that issues of loneliness and well-being are linked to the passive consumption of content. So when people are just kind of scrolling through their news feed and they see, you know, that somebody who they thought there was their friend is at a party that they weren't invited to and things like that. What we have found, however, is that when people are in community, uh, that actually becomes a healthy part of their life. And that's the reason why this is what we're promoting so heavily. And that's why the mission of the company changed. The mission of Facebook right now is give people the power to build community. Because we see in the research that things like groups and actually driving conversations makes people's well-being uh, positive. Thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, tough question for you maybe, but it's Facebook, so you know. Um, <laughs> one of the issues uh, that I think most of us here who use Facebook, you know, is, is the throttling back of delivery of posts over the, you know, X number of years. Sure. From 100% to 30% to 15 to Nine zero. To two. Facebook we're, zero. We're, we're at one percent now, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, is there any consideration, perhaps, with what is go with what you're overseeing and doing at Facebook, that maybe two 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 things come to mind. One, how about for ministries that it's not throttled back to one or two percent, but they get to have ten percent or twenty percent or thirty percent because they're in this arena of faith. Mm -hmm. That would be wonderful, I think, for everybody who has a ministry. Sure. Um, or if that's not possible because Facebook has a bottom line they have to you know, manage. We're just a startup, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. yeah. What about <laughs> then offering an option? <laughs> yeah, just a startup. What about <laughs> offering an option to any company or any business? Hey, you know, you want to have 15% uh, feeding Sure. whether it goes viral or not, mm -hmm. it's a hundred bucks a month, sure. whatever. Something where, because for those of us who've built things, yeah. and I'm not, I'm just speaking about, a, a, you know, spending money to get likes, I get it. to have 20,000 likes, and then I do a post and, you know, a hundred people see it. Yeah. A lot of, this is why a lot of people are pissed off at Facebook. And this is why, one reason a lot of people have left Facebook, yeah. also privacy concerns. But you guys are the gorilla and we need, Facebook, or we need something like Facebook. Sure. So, you know, I would, I wouldn't, not, so I don't know that I so much have a question for you. Maybe, you. maybe, is this something you have mm -hmm. talked about internally? Oh, yeah. And are there options that could, that Facebook and you could come up with yes. down the road? All right. So thank you for that question. Your question uh, is really about the algorithm. And so let me, let me just share that what I shared today is totally anchored on the algorithm change. So when the algorithm was changed, um, at first there was basically a, a high level of content distribution, which is basically what, what we call the ability for people to see what you post. There was a high degree of content distribution for pages, uh, whether it was brands or whatever it may be, public figures, et cetera. 
When the algorithm was changed, page content distribution was lowered, it was downranked. However, group distribution is as high as friends and family. So that's why what I'm talking about today matters so much. Because the probability of someone seeing your content goes up significantly when it's coming from a group. Because the way that the algorithm works is it works by what's called meaningful social interactions. A meaningful social interaction is considered how much time is someone spending on the content, um, how many friends does a person have related to the source of that content, which is why a group becomes important because they've opted into that space, um, and then are they actually interacting with it? Are they having conversations around it? Are they liking it? That's why groups are ranked as highly as friends and family. So yes, we've contemplated it, and the algorithm highly ranks the groups. That's why I'm talking about groups today. Well, and we had, if I could just say, we, sure. we, you know, we, years ago, many of us had groups. Yeah. Them, I know. So, you know. I know. Yeah, so the, the, challenge, the challenge has been um, uh, groups was kind of this like latent thing that was like off to the side and there was no investment in it. Um, the, the mission of the company actually changed around February of 2017 because when we crossed the 2 billion user threshold, Mark was basically like, all right, we've got all these people on this platform. What's the next phase of Facebook's existence? And that's when he started to think about community. And how do we make sure that people are in community? Because to the earlier point about well-being, we were seeing that people were feeling isolated and lonely from passively consuming content. We saw that reversed in groups. People who were members of groups actually had high degrees of well-being. So that's why we've been heavily investing in groups. And that is literally the place to anchor at this point. And I can say as a church online pastor in the past, and actually right now, um, co-admin uh, of a group of 19,000 people, that groups today is a very different yeah. animal than a couple years ago. And groups are working. It, they're thriving and the engagement is so high and that we don't have a concern about the lack of exposure to the people in the yeah. groups, et cetera. So everything that Nona's, basically, if you were taking notes, that's the cheat sheet to success today. <laughs> everything that she said today we've been trying to implement one by one, almost like a checklist. Mm -hmm. And we're not even halfway through the stuff that she has shared. And we're seeing the thriving of all the interaction in the groups yep. that we've had so far today. So um, yeah, Thank you it's, for that. It's, it's a great stuff. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Within those groups and with your experience in ministry, do you recommend having a pastor or elder or deacon be the administrator to monitor those groups? Such a great question. So in terms of community leadership, yes. So there's a difference. The difference between a page and a group is that a page really is about marketing. Like it's very much so about like throwing content out there. Hey, y'all, we want to raise awareness about X, Y, Z. A group is about the people in that space. And so I do recommend that if you can, um, it's always best to have someone who has a heart for people who's leading that space. Um, it's tempting because it's Facebook to just kind of assign it to the social media person and be like, oh, you can just handle it. But the analogy I like to give is if that person is not a person that you would appoint to lead a physical church, they're probably not the right person to lead your Facebook community. Because you're going to see in that space, there are going to be people who are very vulnerable, who are going to say things like, you know what, my husband's walking out on me, I need somebody to talk to. You're going to see that, and so you want to have somebody who has a heart for people. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. Looks like we got time for one. Okay. So in the group, you said you have groups at 19,000 uh, yeah. people. Um, how much management is required of that? You say, okay, it'd be maybe good to have a pastor mm -hmm. over that, um, but how much management, you know, what type of ratio would you apply? So I'll just say super quick and then I'll let you talk about just your personal experience is, you know, there really isn't a magic number. Um, what, I, what I normally say is, so you want to definitely have uh, an administrator level role. And that's basically, they have access to all of the functions and features. They can change anything in the group. So you would have at least one person that can do that. Um, and then there are moderators, which are essentially people who can kind of help keep the community culture healthy. So I typically recommend that if you're starting a community, start with at least one administrator, maybe two. Um, and then you probably want to have at least, you know, two or three moderators who can just kind of check in on the community and make sure it's healthy. There will come a point where the community becomes self-sustaining because people are having so many conversations that all you have to do eventually is just kind of check in, make sure that it isn't going off the rails. So, 
self, <laughs> um, self healing as well. Like Absolutely. We've, we've seen where we don't even need to manage for trolling anymore mm -hmm. because our people almost like push back. If someone trolls in a comment, they push back because we've set the culture of the group that says you need to be generous, you need to be respectful, yeah. right? There's these ground rules mm -hmm. that we've set in terms of culture and the group in itself is starting to pay attention and do that. Now, uh, from a moderator and the, and the admin stuff, I think it's a great place to help your people put their faith into action Absolutely. by volunteering yes. for these type of roles. And yeah. I'm talking baby steps. We have, in one of my groups, um, we have someone whose all their job is, is to approve people who've asked to be a part of the group, right? So you have to, you find the group, yeah. you ask to join, and then now Facebook allows you to ask a couple of questions to qualify them. We have one person that just checks in on that queue of people to request to join, and we've given them some guidelines and rules, and all they're doing is checking yes or no to let people in, and then there's some questions that they'll triage and they'll bring to us that say, okay, here's a little bit, it's, there's no rule to help, what do we do, right? Yep. That baby step allows them to feel comfortable, but also get to know everyone that's coming into the group. And then later they graduate into some moderation role internally in the group. So you have these small things that you can give away to volunteers as they grow in step. It's not this binary all or nothing. You need a Facebook completely specialist or yep. nobody. Um, but again, helping your people to put your faith into action in this capacity is a, is a wonderful thing for many ministries um, and probably for your organization as well. And something that I, I do, so uh, in addition to my work at Facebook, I also have a company called eChurch Partners, and we work with ministries, and we help them do all of this. But um, what I do is, so I have a team of people that really act as that team. However, as we see people in these communities being extremely active, and we see them really caring for people, we'll reach out to them, and we'll just say, listen, we see that, like, you have a heart for ministry. We would love to make you a moderator of this community, and they love it. So when you start to actually reward people, and then you acknowledge it. Like you actually say, we're so excited to announce to this community that, you know, Sister Sally has been promoted to moderator because she's such a light. The next thing you know, people are like, well, I want to be a light too. So they're like, oh, let me see what I can do to get, you know. So you, you, you're rewarding the right behavior. One, one more. We good? Okay. Yeah, one more yes. question. So her question was, she said that um, people tend to like more fan pages than groups. So how do we begin to kind of shift people from uh, pages to groups? So um, there's, there's a couple of things. Once you create a group, you can actually share that group to your page and you can begin to promote the group on your page. Um, there, are, there are also features uh, within a group where you can invite people from the page that your group is linked to. You can invite people directly to join the community. So you just talk about it on the page. Yeah, I <laughs> Yeah. But then for international people who mm -hmm. Okay, so so in terms of international people who basically esteem pages over groups, I think it's just it's it's a culture shift. And and that's what it is. Yeah. It's as you begin to prove success over time, what I would suggest is as you create those communities and you see positive things happening in it, share that on your page as an example. Like this, look at what's happening in this community. We want you to be a part and begin to tell the story on your page. Yeah, and then it'll drive people to the community. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes. No, yeah, okay. last question. Yes, yes. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I uh, was curious if somebody writes something offensive or mm -hmm. inappropriate in the group, and I mean, I can imagine a moderator or admin isn't going to see it right away unless, is there some sort of an alert if there's yeah. something that that Facebook will send out mm -hmm. to admins to be like, hey, check this? Yes, okay. so, so two things on that. One, you can actually set posts to have to be approved. Um, so posts will come into an inbox. As an administrator, you can kind of look at it, approved, 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 and it'll appear. I normally don't recommend that unless you see that like there's just a ton of crazy stuff going on because people want to see their posts immediately. Um, but people can also flag a post. Like if they see something that's wrong, they can flag it and it'll immediately disappear from the, uh, the community to be reviewed by an administrator. Um, so there are many different ways to control the, the, the safety of the space. We also have a feature, and not all communities have it yet because we're rolling it out, where you can indicate keywords that will trigger, automatically trigger administrator review. 
So if somebody makes a post and it says red, and for whatever reason, red is a sensitive word in your community, it'll flag that post and it'll go to your inbox for review. So there are several tools available to help with that. Yes, awesome. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, my name is Scott. I'm with a, a YouTube page called Jutube. Okay. I love um, that. We have a Facebook and uh, mm -hmm. a, a couple of uh, pages in, in the category. And I, I'd like to express to you a concern that we have that uh, criticisms of Israel, um, there seems to be an in inequity that uh, the criticisms of Israel are tolerated even to a, a point of, uh, of, of, of vilification or tolerated when they come from Muslim groups. Hmm. But when there are uh, criticisms of uh, Islamic imperialism, uh, no one, uh, 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 people get suspended, pages get blocked, and things like this. So what's the process that Facebook uses in evaluating, uh, uh, tolerating uh, anti-Zionism, anti-Israelism, and anti-Semitism, but, but banning or banishing uh, people who are criticizing, criticizing uh, news about Islamic imperialism? Thank you for that question. I will tell you, um, content moderation is probably the most, one of the most complicated issues on the platform because there are literally billions of pieces of content that are generated every day. Um, I'm actually working with the World Jewish Congress right now um, on this exact issue, which is how do we make sure that certain types of content is not being automatically flagged for takedown? Because it very well could be that it's a, just an awareness piece that uses certain words. So I'll give you a perfect example. So um, uh, there have been issues where on the platform people have been doing like awareness about um, uh, abortion, right? Well, that word could trigger AI to to be like, oh, take the post down. And then it has to go to manual review and then it'll get restored. But what happens is once that post comes down, it automatically seems like, oh my gosh, you're targeting me. The challenge is AI, because it's not perfect, will oftentimes pull things down and then restore it later. So what we're looking at is we're actually putting in place a content moderation advisory team, which is a global team of leaders who have the lens of sensitive content that could sometimes be taken out of context. And we're trying to figure out, okay, well, how exactly do you make sure that you're automating content that could be perceived as sensitive while also having manual review processes. Yeah, it but, is but when people are getting when people are getting banned or blocked yeah. for 30 days, there's no recourse. If your account gets banned, you should be able to dispute it. Um, I have worked, for example, uh, some of you may know Franklin Graham got banned uh, about a month or so ago. And so as soon as that happened, thankfully, I was able to like call and talk them through it and talk to our policy team. Um, but there is supposed to be a mechanism to dispute it. And it'll come to your email, which it will say, your account got banned for whatever reason. If you would like to dispute it, click here. And then that gets manually reviewed. It is not perfect. I will tell you it is not perfect. And it takes time. And it's frustrating. Um, but because there's so much content. Uh -huh. where, where are the issues adjudicated? Where are they reviewed? Who, and who's reviewing them? So it's a global team of content reviewers. So it's not just like any one place. It's literally people all over the world. Are they people in the Muslim team. world doing it? Oh, people all over the world. People in, in Israel. We have an office, I think, in Jerusalem. We have people all over the world who are looking at content. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that's fair? I'm not saying that it, that it shouldn't be around the world, but if someone, if, uh, if, if Islam teaches that there no, should be no criticism of Islam and you're having a Muslim review it, then how do you expect to get a fair hearing for someone based on, uh, on American uh, free speech principles? It's, it's multiple voices. So, for example, um, there are people who I'm sure would say that if we didn't have that voice at the table, then they would say we were being biased. So it's multiple voices looking at the same piece of content and trying to figure out what their perspective is on the content. It's not perfect, but the reality is that's because there are different, there are different world views. So that's why we have different lenses looking at different issues. Is this something that is being addressed with the World Jewish Con Congress? Yes. But is it secret? Is it kind of... Uh the conversation just happened like last week, oh, just starting the conversation, yeah. And how about Christians who get banned for uh, 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 comments that they're making about uh, the persecution of Christians around the world? It's the exact same process. So if a ban happens, they'll get notified by email that they can dispute it at that time. No, but I mean in terms of the adjudication. Yeah, right. it's the same process. And I will tell you, most uh, accounts that are banned get restored, but it has to go through review. And again, it's really a challenge of frequency. There's just so much content to review. And I think 
if you were on the back end and you could see how much content there is to review, then it would probably make more sense. But I know it's a personal challenge, which is if my account comes down, all I care about is my account. I don't care about the other millions of accounts that you're reviewing. That's the challenge. I will say that we've had a client account banned mm -hmm. automatically, uh, I guess through AI. Yeah. And then you do get an email. There's a blue button. Yeah. You click it. And there actually is a process that you can actually submit more information, and we had it restored. It yeah. wasn't as fast as the client wanted it. Right, of course. But there is a process, and it does work when you, and I think, you, it, I think the point is you got to give legitimate, yeah. um, objective information back to the team so they can actually review it well. Right? Yep. So there's a whole process in place, I think. It does work, yep. um, it's just, and I guess it's just the scale. That's, of that's that the happening. challenge, is it's scale. It's a global, it's yeah. a global challenge, yeah. yeah. And it's a global challenge in multiple languages. So it's not just English either. Right, right. <laughs> it's multiple languages and dialects and all right. that, yeah. Well, but, but shouldn't American complainants be judged by Americans? Uh, as I said, we have content reviewers all over the world. So it yeah. isn't just, and I hear your passion, I hear your concern, that the answer is, the, the true answer is it's complicated. There is no one answer. It's that it has to be reviewed. But it's not, it's not functioning properly now. I would say I, that it I, functions as properly as it can. I mean, per, per the example that you gave, which is you can always dispute it, and then it goes under review yeah. again. Yeah, but, but if it's reviewed under a monkey court from some other culture, then it's not being reviewed according to American well, free speech principles. I, I'm going to table this issue. I think it's hard to talk in generalities. Yeah. And there's probably a very <laughs> specific case here that probably offline that we can talk to yeah, if there's a specific case, through. I'm happy to it's, escalate it. It's not it. just one specific case. It's a whole category of issues having to do with radical Islam. Well, that's certainly outside of the scope of my work, but I'm happy to help you if yeah. I can. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so okay, thank we you. can talk to Nona offline. Thank you very much for that question. Sure. Um, one of the things that I want to, uh, we, we're, we've come to an end, and I really appreciate your time here. Thank you. Um, one of the things, if I can ask you, um, mm -hmm. as we end today's Digital Media Summit is, um, I, I wonder if you can pray with us to commission the people here, because I think one of the things yeah. that in our community that we want to do is not just sit and soak and take the information in, yeah. but we want all of us to be participants and partners in the work that we're doing for the kingdom. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can pray for us and commission our attendees here to be part of the team Would love to. and to go out of these doors and to do the work together. Would love Would you to. Do that? Would love to. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, first, we're just grateful for this week. We're grateful, Lord, for uh, the assignments that you've given to every single one of us on the, uh, the continuum of the spectrum of broadcast and social media. My prayer, Father, is that something that was said today will just uh, catalyze a fire in our hearts that would burn um, in a new and, and brighter way to win the lost through technology. Um, we believe, God, that there is a harvest of souls, Lord, on the internet that are seeking and that are looking for answers to life's challenges, Father. And we know that you are the answer, God. We know that you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. There is no other that we can come to or come to the Father except through you, God. So we pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, Father, that you would just go before us. Give us wisdom, Father. Give us strength uh, that as we talk with our colleagues, and some of them will have questions and they won't understand, and some of them may even say, we don't need to be doing that. I pray, God, that you will prepare their hearts for this new way of ministry, this new way uh, of changing lives. I pray for all of my brothers and sisters who are gathered here today, God, that you would just help us all to have a tremendous impact in these last days. Thank you, God, for what you are doing through all of us. We honor you as Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nona.